will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a male insurance agent and a female client who wants to make changes to her policy. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. Tauber Insurance Company. How can I help you? Good morning. I want to alter my insurance policy. Is that for your house, contents or vehicle? My vehicle. Can you give me the number of the policy, please? Certainly. I have it here in front of me. It's ZQW5009. And what make and model of car is it? It's a Mazda. A Mazda Marvel. And what's the CC rating? Sorry, what do you mean? How big is the engine? Is it 1,500? or 1,800 cc, for example. Oh, that. It's actually much bigger than that. It's 2,500 cc. Thank you. Now, I just have to ask you a few questions to verify your identity. What name is the policy under? Heathcote. Let me just bring that up on the computer. Yes, can I just confirm your first name, please? Well, my first name is Lisa but I'm known by my middle name, Marie. Right. I see both here, but Lisa is the one I want for ID purposes. And your date of birth, Lisa? I mean, Marie. The 22nd of August, 1955. Correct. Just one more question before we get started. Can you remember the password on this policy? Oh dear, I didn't know I had a password on it. Everyone has a password. Would you like to take a guess? Possibly it's my mother's name. And what would that be? Sophia. Sorry, guess again. All right. Oh, I remember now. It's my grandfather's name, Jack. Yes, followed by some numbers. 1897, right? Correct. Now we can get down to business. What exactly do you want to change? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, I think it's overvalued at the moment. Can we reduce the value by $5,000? You mean bring it down to $15,000? Yes, I'm sure it's lost quite a bit of value over the past year. Done. Now, what's the other thing? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10.
Well, I want to add the name of another driver to my insurance policy. Who is it? His name is Samuel Michaels. He doesn't have the same family name as you. No, he doesn't. Is that a problem? No, it shouldn't be. As long as he's over the age of twenty-five, but we find it easier to get approval for family members. Oh, he is family. He's married to my daughter. He's my son-in-law, and he's twenty-eight, in fact. Good. And what would he be using the car for? Would it be business or social purposes? Not really. You see, I've injured my right arm and I'm having difficulty driving. It's not an automatic. I have to use the gear stick. And Sam, that is Samuel, offered to drive me to my appointments and so on. He's a good driver and I feel safe with him. But I'd like to know that the car is still insured with him behind the wheel. So that would be family reasons then. Yes, I think so. Will my premium go up? No, as long as you can provide us with a photocopy of his driver's license, a true copy. You know what I mean. You'll have to get someone from the Department of Transport to sign it, saying that he's seen the original document. I think we can manage that without any difficulty. Oh, and while he's at the department, he should ask them for a record of any driving offences, demerit points. That kind of thing. Only for the last five years, though. We're not interested in anything beyond that. But it's important that he has a clean record for the five previous years. Oh, I'm sure that won't be a problem. Is there anything else you need? Just the date for when you'd like this to take effect. Today, if that's possible. Yes, we can issue temporary cover from today's date. But full cover won't apply until we've received the paperwork and it's been approved. What exactly is temporary? He'll be covered for two full weeks, but it will lapse after that time if there's any problem with his credentials. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a counsellor from health services talking about confidence and goal setting. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Hello, I'm Joe from Health Services, and I'm pleased to be here talking to you today. You've come here today to learn more about gaining confidence and setting goals. How many of you are truly positive thinkers? Positive thinking is the key to confidence. It doesn't matter whether you are playing a sports match. Facing an interview or preparing for an exam, if you apply positive thinking, you will gain confidence. This is the secret: positive thought patterns. Positivity leads to confidence, which in turn 
will optimize your performance. What is the one simple mental strategy that all confident people have in common? They concentrate on success. But don't they ever fail? Don't they make mistakes? What happens when things go wrong? The crucial difference is that they don't dwell on failure. Everybody makes mistakes. I mean, how else do we learn? Rather than giving up or becoming depressed, the best strategy is to register the mistake, note what went wrong, and determine what would have been a better way to act or what could have been done differently in order to achieve a more successful outcome. Then move on. Yes, erase the negative emotions, allow those memories of defeat, frustration, or dissatisfaction to fade and move forward. Negativity erodes confidence. You need to put aside your disappointments and focus on successful outcomes. Oh, it's not that easy, I can hear you saying. Well, no, it's not easy to forget failure, but no one ever fails completely, so congratulate yourself on the areas where you did do well. Mentally replay the best bits, even if they're only a small part. Now, there are two more things you need to do. Firstly, rehearsal. Yes, you heard me. Rehearsal. Surely only actors in a play need to rehearse their parts? No, the truth is, we all need to rehearse. This is a surefire way to build confidence. Before the match, presentation, the exam, or whatever, imagine yourself performing successfully in that particular situation. And here's the second tip. Look confident. That will always give you an extra physiological advantage. So, you can see that mind and body work together on this. You have to think and act positively. Let's talk a bit more about how to look confident. If you have to overcome a challenge, get rid of that anxious expression and rigid posture, those downcast eyes and nervous gestures. Even if you don't feel very self-assured, you can still give the appearance of confidence. Stand tall, hold your head up, make full eye contact and keep an open expression. Replace the frown with a smile if you can manage it. And those hunched shoulders? Relax those shoulder muscles. If you need to, take a deep breath and stretch to release pent-up anxiety and tension. What if you have to make a difficult phone call, for example? Nobody can actually see you, so does it matter what you look like? Yes, it does. Practicing positive body language will help you cross the threshold into a confident mood. Before we move on to talk about goal setting, it may surprise you to know that once you have set a goal in life, the brain responds with a burst of activity, which we experience as... That's right, happiness. And what happens when the goal is achieved? Yes, there is another burst of activity and another feeling of happiness. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. As you can see, the recipe for a happy life is to maintain a positive attitude and keep setting and achieving your goals. So, whatever your goal, whatever it is that you're aiming for, a new job, losing weight, giving up smoking, graduation, you need an appropriate and by appropriate, I mean achievable goal. That's the first step. The next thing to consider is motivation. How do you get going? 
Well, it's more likely to motivate you if you think of the rewards of success rather than focus on failure or what you might lose. So you need to establish your incentives. After that, you'll have to work out the various stages and phases that you'll need to go through along the way and prepare for each one of them. If you're not naturally motivated, keep the targets small and achievable. But it really is important to ensure you collect the resources to accomplish the various steps. If you have performed that particular task before, you may already have the resources, or at least know where to get them from. If not, ask someone who has already succeeded. When you have got this far, the next stage is obvious. Yes, you have to take the first step. That's not quite all there is to it, though. The final thing is to remember to keep track of what you've accomplished. In other words, be sure to maintain a progress log. That way, you can look back at your previous small successes and watch your progress along the way to achieving your goal. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a conversation between two students and their professor, who is asking them to organize a panel discussion for an upcoming conference. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Come in and sit down, Louise, Stuart. I suppose you're wondering why I've asked you both to come here today. Well, we've heard rumours. Forget the rumours. I'll get straight down to business. You know that I'm organising a conference on 17th century English literature? Yes, but... Well, I've arranged for three keynote speakers, and I've invited 25 panellists so that we can have five panel discussions, and I want you two to organise one of the panel discussions. But we haven't done that before. Is it like a team presentation? No, the purpose is quite different. In a team presentation, the group presents agreed-upon views, as you have both done at the end of a group project. Yes. Well... In a panel discussion, the purpose is to put forward different views. We want to expose the audience to several different viewpoints at the same session. It can help the audience evaluate their own positions regarding specific issues. And if it's well conducted, it's usually more interesting than a single speaker forum. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. And what exactly do we have to do? Well, you'll take the role of leader or moderator and assistant. Is that like the role of chairman? Yes, that's it. Sounds daunting. Not at all. 
I've already done a great deal of the preparation myself. Let me run through the procedure with you. I've singled out an issue that will entail quite some conflict of opinion. I've selected panellists who are well informed and will probably have contradictory points of view. That's very important, you know. Actually, I feel a bit nervous. How many panellists will there be? Well, I've invited five panellists for each panel because that's probably the maximum number that an inexperienced moderator can handle. But don't worry, I always invite more than we need because you can be sure someone won't be able to make it. So you'll probably just end up with four, which is a very manageable number. Oh, I see. And I've chosen a moderator. That's you, by the way. Ah, but Stuart will help, right? Yes. I'll get on to timekeeping and whatnot shortly. That's where an assistant is indispensable. But what procedure do we follow to conduct the panel discussion? Don't worry. I was just about to say, I've also settled on the format. What is it? There are various formats that can be followed, but I've always found this one to be very effective. Yes. Okay. Make some notes on these guidelines as I run through them and ask me questions about anything you don't understand. We're ready. Firstly, the moderator introduces the topic and the panelists. But we don't know who the panelists are. Don't worry. I've prepared a short biographical introduction for each one of them, and I'll give you that information tomorrow. Oh, good. Next, the panelists are given a set amount of time to present their views on the topic. I'd say about two minutes each should be sufficient. Now, this is where Stuart's timekeeping is going to be important. You have to keep to the schedule all the way through because the lecture room has only been booked for an hour. How do I indicate when the time is up? You stand off to one side of the panel, either with your back to the audience or hidden from the audience, but in full view of the panel and moderator. You have a digital clock or timer, and you hold up the appropriate number of fingers to give the number of minutes. When the time is up, you make a cutting gesture with your hand. Ah, but. What if the panelists keep talking? Then that's your job to politely intervene and move on to the next segment, which is the discussion itself. Panelists discuss, ask questions, and react to the opinions of other panel members. This, of course, is their primary function and should occupy about sixty percent of the allotted time. Stuart will watch the time, right? Yes, because you'll be making brief notes. Why? Well, when the time's up, the moderator shuts down the debate and provides a summary of the discussion. Oh, and then it's over. Well, no. The secondary function of the panel is to answer questions from the audience, and that should take up the remaining fifteen to twenty minutes. It's the leader's role to recognise appropriate questions and reject those not related to the subject. During the question period, you must maintain strict control. And this will most likely be the toughest part of the whole job. Oh dear! Stuart will of course help you here by ensuring that as many people as possible have a chance to ask their questions, and that no one member of the audience tries to dominate. With about five minutes to go, he'll announce that there's time for only a couple more questions. Then announce last question. And then it's over. Not quite. You still have to acknowledge the involvement of the panelists. And invite the audience to thank them with a round of applause. Should I clap too? Yes, you should both take part in the applause. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a talk on hydroelectric power. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to our series on renewable resources. The topic today is hydropower. As you most probably know, hydro means water, so we are talking about using water to generate electricity. Of course, there are many ways to generate electricity, but hydropower is important to the community. Firstly and obviously, because it's renewable, the Earth's hydrologic cycle of constant evaporation and transpiration provides a continual supply of water from rainfall and snowmelt. The second point to consider is its efficiency. Hydropower plants are able to convert approximately ninety percent of the energy from the falling water into electric energy, whereas many fossil-fueled plants. Lose more than half of the energy content of their fuel by way of waste heat and gases. For this reason, they are very efficient. Hydropower is also clean. It doesn't emit harmful gases that contribute to air pollution, acid rain, and global warming. No trucks, trains, or pipelines are needed to bring fuel to the site, and there's no noise pollution either. Furthermore, hydropower plant machinery. Is fairly simple and runs at slow speeds, which makes it reliable and durable. And hydropower units are flexible also; they have the ability to start quickly and adjust rapidly to changes in demand for electricity, thus enabling them to meet peak loads. But this also allows them to serve as reserve capacity and bring more stability to the power system overall. The dams that provide hydroelectric power also have other uses. Such as navigation, flood damage reduction, water supply, recreation, irrigation, and low flow augmentation. But it's not the purpose of this talk to go into those details. How do the hydropower plants work? Well, a dam is built across a river, which captures water to form a reservoir and raises the water level to create head. Think of head as the vertical distance that the water falls. As it passes through the dam, in other words, the difference in water level between the reservoir behind the dam and the river below. Water from the reservoir flows through an intake gate into a penstock. This is a kind of narrow channel which leads to the turbine below. The force of the water causes the turbine to rotate rapidly, which in turn drives the generator to spin and produce electricity. The electricity is carried the long distances from the powerhouse to substations on the outskirts of cities via power lines. Can you build a hydropower unit on any river? Well, no. Just having water in a river isn't enough. A good dam site must have enough stream flow as well as enough head. A fast-flowing river on the plains is probably not suitable because a dam couldn't be built high enough. To provide the head needed for efficient production of electricity. On the other hand, dams in arid high country may have plenty of head but insufficient stream flow. The perfect spot for a hydropower plant is where the right combination of stream flow and head exists. What about the environment? Surely the construction of large dams has an environmental impact. Well, yes, it does. Certainly, dams and reservoirs are built to improve the lives of people living in towns, farming communities, and cities. But there must be a balance between development and preserving the natural environment. Needless to say, the natural river environment is changed, which leads to changes in river ecology and aquatic habitat. Sometimes, for example, dissolved oxygen levels below dams get so low in summer. That there is a negative impact on aquatic life. These levels can be improved, however, by using special aerating turbines and/or injecting oxygen directly into the stream flow. In order to protect and improve the habitat for endangered and other species of birds, fish, and water life, there needs to be a thorough review of operating plans to see if a better balance can be achieved. Hydropower plant design and operation. Must not only meet the needs of consumers for electricity, but work hand in hand with agencies whose concern is for the fish and wildlife, water quality, 
and water supply. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.